Hi, I'm Zach Skidker. I'm a PhD student at Purdue University working in Herrick Labs. And in this video, I'm going to present some of our work on a chemi-resistive CO2 sensor. So, share my screen and we can get started. So as I mentioned, uh, this video will present a chemi-resistive CO2 sensor based on uh, CNT functional polymer composite films, uh, some work we've been doing at Herrick Labs in Purdue University. So to start with, I'll ask the obvious question as to why are we interested in monitoring carbon dioxide? Um, so as we all know, we've been monitoring it in the atmosphere for about the last 100 years or so with the concerns of global climate change. And as well, there are several industrial and commercial uses uh, where we're monitoring CO2 levels. However, these last two points are where I'm going to focus, uh, which is driving our project more so in human presence and then translating into the building space uh, with HVAC, uh, so occupancy detection within buildings then. And this is driven uh, in part by our project sponsor, um, ARPA-E, which is an agency within the U.S. Department of Energy. And this funding is under the sensor program, which in this case, sensor is an acronym for saving energy nationwide and structures with occupancy recognition. Um, so uh, occupancy recognition within buildings is important for advanced controls. And in this case, CO2 sensors uh, for buildings for the data-driven world that we live in um, for, in particular, something such as demand controlled ventilation, but one can easily extrapolate to other sorts of smart building measures. Um, and these advanced building applications require sensors that are low cost, so something that's less than $100, whereas commercial CO2 sensors are currently on the order of hundreds of dollars. Uh, low power, less than five milliwatts or so, in order to make wireless sensing something that's relevant. Uh, most commercial sensors are on the order of hundreds of milliwatts, which preclude them from wireless sensing, or at least any uh, extensive wireless sensing that could occur within a building. And as well, non-intrusive, which CO2 sensors have a little bit of an edge on, uh, mostly because people don't like having a camera watching them nonstop for simple occupancy detection. So in order to improve our buildings and uh, have smart buildings, smart controls, uh, we're driving towards these metrics uh, for a CO2 sensor. And our sensor being a chemi-resistive device, the secret sauce, so to speak, is in the functional materials. And the materials in this case are PEI, PEG, and carbon nanotubes in a composite layer, as the title alludes to. Um, the PEI and the PEG are utilized as the CO2 absorbing layer, whereas the carbon nanotubes are the charge carriers. Um, and as we can see a little bit from the schematic here, uh, the PEI endos the carbon nanotubes with its electron negative lone pairs. Um, upon exposure to CO2, the amino groups readily react to form electron deficient ammonium cations and the end doping effect is weakened. And this leads to a change in the carrier concentration of the CNTs, which is how we get our sensing mechanism. Um, the PEI is P-doping the carbon nanotubes essentially with CO2 and PEG holds in water, which provides a proton and enhances that response. So to develop our sensors for to fabricate them. Uh, we start with our CNT solution up here and we wash that in chlorosiphonic acid. Uh, we then deposit it onto glass slides and slide them in order to create a carbon nanotube thin film. Um, then with that thin film between the glass slides, we gently place it onto water so that we can float the thin film on top of the water and delaminate it, transfer it from the glass slides. And we take our pre-patterned substrate, our PCB substrate, um, and we can scoop up the carbon nanotubes, that thin layer of carbon nanotubes 
on top of our pre-patterned electrodes. So with the carbon nanotube layer, then we cast our polymer uh, PIPG blend on top to complete uh, functionalization of the device. And you can see our complete functionalized device here at the bottom left. Uh, and the PCB structure is more so to fit inside our test chamber, uh, the circular size, as well as vent hole here. And we have the opportunity for six different sensors here, or six different electrodes that we cast our functional materials on. And as well, we have another set over here that we can do testing with. And these are simply output to pins, which we can then measure the resistance across. So that shown here, as I said, we're just simply measuring the resistance across that material. So here you can see the thin gap that we have where we're applying that material and simply measuring the resistance and outputting our measurements to LabVIEW. But then if we take a look at the rest of our uh, testing system, it's relatively simple with our supply gases. So we have the CO2 obviously, and then we typically use nitrogen as a carrier gas uh, just for ease of control. So, um, with something that's inert in the background so we can control precisely the amount of CO2 that is in our test chamber. We control this with mass flow controllers all going into a mixing manifold before being deposited into our test chamber. And with that, we can control humidity by inserting a water bubbler in line to one of the MFC or after one of the MFCs into one of the nitrogen streams and we control temperature with thermoelectric coolers. So we can simulate indoor environments by controlling the temperature and relative humidity that it's within our test chamber. And with that in mind, with buildings being our end application, uh, we developed a test zone based on a range of temperature and relative humidity using ASHRAE standards as a guideline. So we used ASHRAE standard for thermal environmental conditions for human occupancy. And this standard outlines a comfort zone uh, where most people are comfortable, uh, so to speak, with a within a humidity and temperature range. And this comfort zone is roughly defined as 22 to 26 degrees Celsius and from about 10% relative humidity or 20% relative humidity up to 80% uh, relative humidity. And we use this to bound our test conditions, uh, the area of interest uh, that we want our sensor to perform in. Again, this is for building applications or targeted for building applications. So with that in mind, we took a four corners and center approach where we test at each of the boundary, four boundary conditions as well as a central location. And taking a look at this central location to start, uh, we can see the sensor response. So that corresponding to this left axis and is the blue line. So we have our relative change in resistance and the CO2 concentration corresponding to the right Y axis. And that is these red shaded bars in the shaded area on the plot. So you can see that as we're increasing CO2 concentration from a background of 400 ppm, which is approximately outdoor air conditions, a clear decrease in resistance every time we're introducing more CO2 from that background. And we can as well see even here in the time series plot um, that the change is relatively proportional relative to the concentration that's present. So a small concentration here, we see a smaller absolute change in resistance. So extrapolating and after several days of testing at each of these different test conditions, we can plot out this onto a calibration curve type of plot. So our change in resistance at each of these concentrations. And so taking the average at each of these different testing conditions. Um, and we can see a little bit of a dependence on temperature 
Uh, however, the bigger dependence is on humidity. So as we increase humidity, we see a enhanced response of our sensor uh, to CO2. And as I had mentioned before, water, which is why we added the PEG into our polymer blend, enhances our CO2 responsiveness of the sensor. I, and we can clearly see that here. So it can work throughout the comfort zone as well. It's a clear, relatively linear relationship at each of the different CO2 concentrations. And on top of that, we can look instead perhaps at the rate of change in resistance. So we take the total change or we can take the derivative of that for a much quicker response. Um, and we can see a very similar pattern where we have an enhanced response at higher humidity levels and a relatively linear response relative to the CO2 concentration. So this is a promising result in terms of looking for a CO2 sensor for buildings. It, it can perform fairly well across that entire space. So in conclusion, we developed a chemi-resistive CO2 sensor based on PEI, PG, CNT composite materials. And it's such that it's relevant for indoor CO2 monitoring. Uh, the sensor is very low cost. It's less than a dollar, even in this research setting. And also extremely low power, which allows it to be something that can be wirelessly deployed, or at least potentially so. We're only using about 100 microwatts of power. Um, so this gives us a promising solution to using in the building space. And with that, I'll thank you for attending this presentation.